Hello and welcome to Maximum Kraftwerk, the first talking book about the band. It was written and researched by Tim Footman. Music is by Amanda Thompson and it's read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Mainly we're interested in the everyday context of technology. So we've also been working with engineers and uh, not actually inside the technology but uh, using technology and viewing different aspects like man-machine aspects of like cooperation between us as men and machines. That's been what craft work is about. Pop music has undergone two revolutions. The first came in 1954, when a Memphis record producer called Sam Phillips heard a teenage truck driver singing a song for his mother and realised that he'd discovered the synthesis of black R&B, white country and jazz-influenced crooning that became what we know as rock and roll. The trucker was, of course, Elvis Presley. The second revolution was less immediate and less specific. It came from a number of sources, chiefly the gay nightclubs of New York and Chicago, the sound systems of Jamaica and the Bronx, and most bizarrely, a rented loft in Dusseldorf, Germany. The fusion of these influences resulted in what we now know by the vague umbrella term, dance music. It was music that rejected the myth of the rock and roll guitar hero once and for all. In fact, it pretty much jettisoned the idea of musical expertise being at all relevant to successful pop music. What was important was an understanding of technology, an ability to manipulate sounds already in existence, and an awareness of what social impact and resonance those sounds might have. One aspect of this revolution was the cult of DJ. Whether he was holding court in New York's Paradise Garage or on a street corner in Kingston. Another was a philosophy that less is more, that music is at its most powerful when stripped to the raw ingredients of bleeps and beats. This synthesised minimalism has many sources, not least in the avant-garde and experimental classical music that developed throughout the 20th century. But the responsibility for getting this music onto mainstream radio and TV, into clubs and onto the stages of rock festivals, was down to the proprietors of that loft in Dusseldorf. They called themselves Kraftwerk. Theirs is not a tale of drugs, groupies and prima donna behaviour making it into the tabloid gossip columns. Well, not much. It is more about technology, rhythms, enigma, secrecy, matching suits, robots, motorways, bicycles, and the wonders of the pocket calculator. Not very rock and roll, unless of course your intention is to change the very notion of what rock and roll can be. started in 1970 with our Kling Klang studio in Düsseldorf with just an old tape recorder and we got the first synthesizers. It's a very intense performance because we control all the parameters, the levels and and knobs and switches uh, so the music is very sensitive. Germany after 1945 was a nation destroyed. The shells of the Red Army and the bombs of the Royal Air Force had flattened great cities like Berlin and Dresden. The country itself was scythed in two, with the East controlled as a puppet regime of the Soviet Union and the West run by an uneasy alliance of the British, French and Americans. Hitler's capital, Berlin, was like the country in miniature, carved into four zones, although it hovered like a dispossessed island amidst the drab conformity of the Communist German Democratic Republic. In the early 60s, the East German authorities became so fed up with their citizens fleeing for the western zones of the city that they put up a wall overnight, supposedly to keep the westerners out. It would stay there for 28 years. But the destruction wasn't only physical. The denazification programs of the post-war years, intended to make Germans confront the evils of the Holocaust that had been carried out in their name, made people wary of many aspects of German culture. 
the wonders of German classical music now smacked of the bellicose triumphalism that had brought Hitler to power. Wagner, especially the Führer's favourite, made uncomfortable listening for German music lovers. This was the cultural landscape confronting students of classical music at the Remscheid Conservatory in Dusseldorf in the mid-1960s. Among them were a keyboard player named Ralf Hutter and a flautist called Florian Schneider Esselben. Both came from unremarkable professional middle-class backgrounds. Ralph was born in Krefeld, near Dusseldorf, on the 20th of August 1946, the son of a doctor. Florian was born in Bodensee, in southern Germany, on April 7, 1947, but his family moved to Dusseldorf three years later. His father was an architect, responsible for designing several important railway stations and airports, built as part of Germany's post-war reconstruction. Although both young men were talented musicians, they were frustrated by the heavy hand of the classical tradition, exemplified by Bach, Mozart and Beethoven. They became interested in the avant-garde sounds of John Cage and Karl Heinz Stockhausen, composers who came from similar conservatory backgrounds to Ralph and Florian, but attempted to tear up the rulebook of conventional classical music. Both composers were especially keen to break away from the instrumentation that had been the norm in classical music for over two centuries. Stockhausen's experiments with electronics and tapes would be especially influential on the ideas brewing in Dusseldorf. Ralph and Florian also looked beyond classical music for inspiration. American free jazz musicians such as Ornette Coleman and Albert Ayler were redefining listeners' ideas about harmony and melody, at the same time drawing accusations from critics that they couldn't actually play their instruments properly. The belief that the originality of an idea was more artistically important than the skill of execution was a crucial one to much 20th century creativity and has particularly influenced conceptual visual artists from Marcel Duchamp to Damien Hirst. It was one more ingredient in Ralph and Florian's musical recipe and both played in jazz bands while they were studying in Dusseldorf. What might be called rock or pop music was another influence. Germany had unwittingly played a crucial role in the development of the 60s pop revolution when the Beatles played in the sleazy clubs of Hamburg during the early 1960s. But the creative input of German musicians was negligible. The majority of German pop music at the time consisted of slavish imitations of British and American acts, such as the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and the Beach Boys. Part of this was down to the creative nervousness that many Germans felt in the post-war era. They felt so guilty about the negative aspects of their own culture that, rather than develop a style that was essentially German, they preferred to make second-rate carbon copies of foreign pop. Ralph and Florian, however, represented a new generation. They had been born in the years immediately following the war, so, although they knew about the horrors of the Hitler era, they had no personal experience of them. They felt able to create music on their own terms, drawing on influences from Beethoven and Stockhausen, rock and jazz, and coming up with something that was new and distinctively German. We were coming from some kind of, on one side, from classical music, being trained as young kids and from there with the influence of the art world and the electronic world and living into the cultural environment around Dusseldorf so it just came to our mind that we had to find our own musical language. Krautrock is a difficult word. In the politically correct 21st century it smacks of crass British jingoism and the basil faulty attitude of don't mention the war but it is a word that has become attached to a particular strain of experimental music from the late 1960s and 70s, and importantly, it is a word with which German musicians seem comfortable. In some ways, kraut rock is similar to the progressive rock that was dominant in Britain during the same period. Both genres take conventional rock sounds as a starting point, but then add complex variations from other styles, such as classical, jazz or Indian music. These are usually coupled with obtuse, self-conscious lyrics, often on philosophical themes. But Krautrock differs from the music of, say, Yes or Genesis, or Emerson, Lake and Palmer, in a couple of crucial ways. 
German musicians tended to be more concerned with finding new and arresting sounds to startle the listener than with wanting to amaze them with displays of instrumental virtuosity. They seized upon innovations in synthesizers and other electronic instruments and were also keen to test the limits of studio technology. At the same time, Krautrock was laced with a sense of ironic humour that the pompous prog rockers, with a few exceptions, sorely lacked. The performer's easygoing acceptance of the pejorative Kraut was perhaps an indication that they didn't take themselves as seriously as their contemporaries in the English-speaking world. Ralph and Florian's first serious attempt to express their various musical ideas can be seen as an early example of this musical genre. Calling themselves Organisation, they teamed up with a singer, Basil Harmoudi, and a bass guitarist and drummer. Ralph played electric organ and Florian doubled on flute and violin. The quintet's only album, called Tone Float, is a free-flowing, jazzy piece with several percussive workouts that seem to carry strong influences of traditional Indian music. Organisation achieved some exposure, even appearing on the mainstream German TV show Beat Club. But sales of the album were disappointing, and by 1970, Ralph and Florian had split from their three colleagues. By this stage, other German acts had picked up the kraut rock baton, with Cannes from Cologne and Berlin's Tangerine Dream, achieving modest success even beyond Germany. But Ralph and Florian had already outgrown the jazz and rock conventions that underpinned organisation. They had become Kraftwerk. Kraftwerk, the second is Kraftwerk 2 and the third is Ralph and Florian. We started from electroacoustic, uh, like transforming with our Kling Kling studio into the fully synthesized uh, music from 73, 74, Autobahn, gradually progressing into the synthesized music. The duo's choice of a name was an appropriately ambiguous move. They were well aware that, to an English speaker, Kraftwerk sounds like Kraftwerk. Doubtless, many people assumed that the name carried implications of methodical skill and physical dexterity. In fact, Kraftwerk is German for power station. The new name was a hint, at least to anyone with a grasp of the language, that Ralph and Florian were less concerned with instrumental ability and more with the scope of technology at their disposal. Electronic instruments had been around since the 1920s. The Russian-made theremin and the French Ondes Martineau had both been used to a limited extent by classical and pop musicians. The Mellotron, which used pre-recorded musical tapes, activated by a conventional keyboard, also enjoyed a brief flurry of popularity in the 1960s and 70s. But the key innovation, as far as Kraftwerk was concerned, was the Moog synthesizer, invented in the early 1960s. It was the first electronic instrument capable of creating new sounds rather than amending the pitch and volume of existing sounds. Its creator, Dr. Robert Moog, had developed it in conjunction with a composer, Walter Carlos, who would later have a sex change and become Wendy. Carlos's album, Switched on Bach, applied the new technology to the music of the revered German composer and demonstrated the possibilities of the new instrument. By this stage, Kraftwerk had taken out a lease on a large loft near the railway station in Düsseldorf and, with the assistance of a recording engineer called Connie Plank, had begun to convert it into a studio. Their music had by now jettisoned most of the jazz rhythms that characterised the Tone Float album and emphasised sounds for their own sake. The first, self-titled Kraftwerk album, made with drummers Klaus Dinger and Andreas Hohmann, highlights the sonic possibilities of the band's new Space Age keyboards, as well as some early drum machines. But Kraftwerk had not rejected conventional instruments altogether. The track Stratovarius showcases Florian's atonal violin work, and on Rookzuk, he returns to his first musical love, the flute. The Kraftwerk album sold as badly as organization's sole effort, and the band seems to have had a failure of nerve. They recruited guitarist Michael Rother and bassist Eberhard Kranmann, and for a while it seemed as if Kraftwerk would become just another kraut rock band. At one point, Ralph Hutter even left the group, although this was a temporary aberration. He was back in time for the recording of the second album, entitled, inevitably, Kraftwerk II. 
Then Rotha and Dinger departed to form the krautrock duo Neu, and Ralph and Florian found themselves alone in the studio. Without full-time drummers, they made full use of electronic percussion, although they still hadn't deserted conventional instruments entirely. The first track on Kraftwerk 2, Kling Klang, is a 17-minute mini-symphony of electronic tones and rhythms, but there is still room for one of Florian's exquisite flute riffs. Some of the shorter tracks even have guitar solos, a rock cliché that seems entirely at odds with what Kraftwerk were doing. These were frustrating years for the pair. They were pushing existing musical and recording technology to its limits, but this didn't seem to translate into any kind of critical praise, let alone major record sales. Their contemporaries, Can and Tangerine Dream, were just as bad at shifting units, but at least they were showing up on the cultural radar. Even Neu, a band composed of former Kraftwerk sidemen, had a level of cult credibility. For Kraftwerk's third album, Ralph und Florian, the pair tried to progress. The traffic cone image that had provided some kind of visual unity for the first two offerings was jettisoned in favour of a slightly sinister photograph of the pair, looking like artificially polite teachers at a parents' evening. But in terms of sales, Ralph und Florian was as unsuccessful as its predecessors. It's an inconsistent piece, as if the pair can't decide which direction they want to go in. There's even a steel guitar solo, hinting at some kind of mythical Kraftwerk go country and western side project. However, a couple of tracks do begin to hint at what would be identified as the classic Kraftwerk sound. Tanz music, or dance music, is propelled by a synthesized handclap beat, suggesting that someone, somewhere, might feel the inclination to dance to this stuff. Then the last piece, Anana Symphony, literally, Pineapple Symphony, begins with a voice chanting the title. Not only is it the first vocal on a Hutter Schneider track since the days of organisation, but the voice has been electronically processed to within an inch of its life. On first hearing, it's difficult to tell whether this nonsensical repetitive verbiage is, in fact, a human at all. In fact, it could almost be a robot. We just been uh, having endless tours in Germany from the universities in my old Volkswagen, which is on the cover of Autobahn. And that was like a vision of our music coming from the car radio, because in Germany we wouldn't be playing our music on the radio. And so this was a fiction. And then by later doing some kind of a uh, Autobahn drone, Raga, Ham humming and the engines are tuned. We did this with synthesizer, controlled oscillators, filters, and then this vision has become a reality for us. It's an old cliché, but it's true. Adolf Hitler may have wrought unspeakable damage on his adopted country, but he did leave it with a highly efficient transport infrastructure. Ralph and Florian's studio, now called Kling Klang, after a track on Kraftwerk 2, was close to the main railway line in Dusseldorf, and the rhythmic rattle of the trains provided a constant soundtrack to their work. They were also playing occasional live gigs throughout Germany, and usually travelled on the country's vast motorway network, known as the Autobahns. Building on the unyielding rhythms of tracks like Tanz music, the band began to create music that reflected the mechanical sounds that surrounded them. By now, Ralph and Florian had expanded the two-piece Kraftwerk lineup again, taking on guitarist and violinist Klaus Röder and percussionist Wolfgang Fleur. The result was the track Autobahn, a turning point for Kraftwerk's career and a key moment in the history of popular music. Autobahn takes a basic monotonous riff, tweaks it with sound effects of truck horns and splashing puddles and stretches the whole experience out to 22 minutes. There had been long hypnotic tracks before, the Velvet Underground's 17-minute heroine and Rent Boys epic, Sister Ray, was a clear influence on Kraftwerk's early sound and Krautrock as a whole. But Autobahn takes a synthesized rhythm and places it at the heart of the music. Techno, Acid House and all their many variants start here. Kraftwerk knew that they had something special on their hands, but they weren't prepared for the level of success that Autobahn would achieve. 
a highly truncated version was released as a single and made the top 30 in Britain and the United States. The dour-looking, soberly dressed band found themselves on TV pop shows alongside glam rockers, teeny boppers and other representatives of 1974's dominant pop styles. Autobahn was regarded by many as something of a novelty single. Indeed, much of its appeal was based on a comic misunderstanding. The repetitive chant of Fahren, 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 German for drive, 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 was understood by many to be fun, 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 a nod to the hedonistic California sunscapes of the Beach Boys. Brian Wilson's family harmonisers, strongly influenced by the legendary Chuck Berry, had been among the pioneers of songs about cars as a specific sub-genre of pop music. But Kraftwerk maintained that the similarity was nothing more than a mildly amusing coincidence, and the media, buying into the myth of humorless Teutons, believed them. Kraftwerk was suddenly a name to drop in the coolest circles. The Autobahn album, although it contained nothing else approaching the brilliance of the title track, sold more than all the band's previous albums combined. Indeed, Ralph and Florian applied a Year Zero policy to the first three Kraftwerk albums, refusing to acknowledge their existence. They have never had an official CD release and are now only available as illicit bootlegs. Autobahn was also the first Kraftwerk album on which the band made a wholehearted effort to ditch conventional instruments altogether. The dominant sound on the title track is that of the trusty Moog synthesizer. The most real elements are the taped sound effects. From now on, Kraftwerk's status as technicians, as engineers, would be more important than any idea that they were musicians. Rather than attempt to capitalise on their newfound fame, Kraftwerk returned to the Kling Klang studio and began to put together an album with little of the catchy, radio-friendly qualities that had characterised Autobahn. Radioactivity, a concept album about broadcasting, also saw the first appearance of Karl Bartos, who replaced Klaus Röder. Feedback, static, stabs of Morse code and a succession of indefinable beeps seemed to be a step back to the band's earlier albums. Although Radioactivity didn't spawn any international hit singles, there was a small concession to accessibility, in that the title track was the first Kraftwerk song with an English language lyric. Die Stimme der Energie, or The Voice of Energy, brings back the disembodied voices introduced in Ananas Symphony that would become a trademark of Kraftwerk's sound in the next few years. An Om Sweet Om, a play on the name for the International Unit of Electrical Resistance, displayed yet another innovation for which Kraftwerk can be thanked. Bad jokes about physics. Radioactivity was an aberration. From now on, Kraftwerk would operate from the blueprint laid down by the Autobahn album. Rhythm and repetition would become the band's signature, as they appeared to squeeze the last remnants of humanity from their music. Well, there's certainly a, a pop element to it, like the or some kind of black humor. It's many things at the same time. That's wonderful because today, with all the tools available, and everybody is in electronic music mm. today. Of course, Kraftwerk were not the only performers using synthesizers and electronic instruments to create popular music. The Beatles had used Moogs on the Abbey Road album and Pink Floyd made enormous use of the VCS3 synth on their monster album Dark Side of the Moon. Stevie Wonder's studio collaborations with the synth duo Tonto's Exploding Headband took soul music into new directions. Rock titans such as the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin used the magic boxes to add texture and interest to their increasingly dull stadium noodling. But these bands were bringing synthesizers into the existing lineup of guitars and drums, and on the whole, using them just as if they were conventional keyboard instruments, such as organs or pianos. What Kraftwerk were doing was attempting to remove the so-called real instruments from the picture entirely. In the mid-1970s, the BBC television programme Tomorrow's World featured the band in an item about musical technology. It now looks almost comic, as the earnest interviewer attempts to get his head round the idea of music without instruments. But Kraftwerk were taking things even further. 
their ideal seemed to be to create music without musicians. In 1977, they released the Trans Europe Express album, a return to the rhythmic perfection of Autobahn. On the surface, it seemed like a hymn of praise to Europe, with the title track replicating the experience of a transcontinental train journey, just as Autobahn felt like a high-speed car journey. As the mythical train passes through Berlin, Ralph acknowledges the presence of David Bowie and Iggy Pop, two rock icons who were busy adding yet another layer to the decadent mythology of the divided city. The opening track, Europa Endlos, is as mythical as any contemplation of America from the likes of Chuck Berry or Bruce Springsteen. There's even a nod to Ralph and Florian's conservatory training, with a charming tribute to the Viennese composer Franz Schubert. But elsewhere, there are hints that the inhabitants of this technological and economic powerhouse aren't all they're cracked up to be. Schaufensterpuppen, or showroom dummies, presents Europeans as glossy automata, neutered and brainwashed by consumerism. This ambivalence about the glories of European culture was important. Kraftwerk's obvious adoration for advanced technology, coupled with their clean-cut, strong-jawed image, led some outsiders to suggest that they were at the very least toying with fascist imagery. The American rock critic Lester Bangs once said that Florian Schneider looked like a man who could push a button and incinerate half the world without blinking. An overstatement, but you could sort of see where he was coming from. Few went so far as to suggest seriously that Kraftwerk were genuine Nazi sympathisers, but Germany's relationship with its European neighbours was still prickly. The Second World War had only ended a little over 30 years before. Moreover, in the mid-1970s, the relationship between pop music and right-wing politics was under the microscope. Guitar legend Eric Clapton had apparently voiced support for the anti-immigration ideas of the British politician Enoch Powell, and David Bowie drew gasps when he seemed to give a Nazi salute at London's Victoria Station. Kraftwerk avoided such a level of scrutiny, partly by seldom giving interviews. But this aloofness also allowed people to make questionable assumptions about what their views might be. They didn't help matters with their choice of album art either. The band members are represented in a slightly kitsch style that definitely harks back to German state art of the 1930s. They stare into the distance, like idealised examples of Aryan manhood listening to a speech by the Führer. Their next album, The Man Machine, seemed to sidestep such specific political issues by reaching into the realms of science fiction for its themes. In some ways, Kraftwerk weren't just writing songs on sci-fi themes, they were living them out. By now they had achieved their vision for the Kling Klang Studio, of a music-making space equipped only with computers and synthesizers. Visuals, such as record sleeves, presented the band members more like robots than human beings. In case anybody missed the hint, the opening track of the new album was called Die Roboter, or The Robots. The title track continued the theme, throwing up ideas of androids and other syntheses of robotics with human flesh. Metropolis and Neon Lights foreshadowed the superficial glamour of New Romanticism, one of the many genres that Kraftwerk would influence. However, many of the lyrics also carried forward the previous album's warnings about the glossy superficiality of modern consumer culture, especially in the icily beautiful The Model. While the lyrics on The Man Machine were less open to political interpretation, the sleeve adds another layer of ambiguity. As if to head off the whispers about supposed fascist leanings that plagued Trans-Europe Express, this time the design is based on Soviet constructivist concepts and the band's red shirts make them look like members of the Young Communist League. Following the release of The Man Machine in 1978, the sonic emissions from the Kling Klang studio tailed off for a while. But over the next few years, the echoes of the Kraftwerk sound would reverberate around the planet. Before we took our Kling Klang studio and I was uh, tons of equipment and uh, was very fragile and sometimes you know the, the music machines would be out of tune or would run out of tune and electricity currency changes and such a lot of problems coming and we've been working very much uh, during the day to, to set up for the concert. 
which we couldn't do so many. And uh, but nowadays we're very mobile. What they used to say about the Velvet Underground was that only about 500 people bought their debut album when it came out, but every one of them started a band. As the 1970s ended, it seemed the same might be true of the likes of Trans Europe Express and The Man Machine. Apart from their one-off notoriety with Autobahn single, Kraftwerk were not a significant band in terms of record sales. But suddenly it seemed as if every musician was talking about them in hushed tones of reverence. Part of this was down to the fact that the price of synthesizers and other electronic keyboards had fallen steadily over the decade. They were also getting much smaller and could be carried almost as easily as an electric guitar. Another factor was the rise of punk rock. Most of the original punk bands had used the conventional rock lineup of guitars, bass and drums. But synths fitted in with the punk aesthetic, in that you could create an interesting noise with a minimal amount of talent. In fact, they had an advantage over guitars. For the truly ham-fisted wannabe musician, they never needed to be tuned. The first explosion of synthesizer-based pop occurred in Britain in the late 1970s and early 1980s. It existed as a strand of the amorphous musical genre that was known as post-punk, the only unifying factor being that the anger of punk was harnessed to slightly more complex and imaginative music. Acts such as The Human League, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, Depeche Mode, Blamange and Soft Cell began to take the sound of synthesizer technology onto top of the pops. Of course, Kraftwerk weren't the sole influence. David Bowie's so-called Berlin albums, Brian Eno's experimental post-Roxy music work, and the aggressive nihilism of the American duo Suicide were all pieces of the jigsaw. But Kraftwerk's obsession with technology, their apparent desire to squeeze humanity out of the creative process, and their air of melancholy struck a particular chord with bands dealing with subjects such as nuclear war, adolescent alienation, and the advent of Thatcherism. One performer who wore Kraftwerk's influences on his charcoal grey sleeve was Gary Newman, also known as Tubeway Army. He combined mechanical sounds with a scowling, robotic image that was sufficient to earn him two number one hits in 1979 and a career that continues to the present day. Another act that was widely seen as owing a major debt to Kraftwerk was a bunch of fellow Germans called Trio, whose single Da 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 reached the number two spot in the British charts in 1982. In fact, Trio were seen by some as a spoof of Kraftwerk, or maybe even Ralph and Florian themselves under a pseudonym, playing a weird postmodernist joke. But although Trio weren't taken particularly seriously, they owed more than a taste for technology with a Kling Klang crew. Their deadpan, slightly melancholic tones echoed Kraftwerk's own songs, something like the sound of a confused android trying to get in touch with his own humanity. Kraftwerk again became a name that new bands wanted to invoke, alongside the likes of The Velvet Underground, The Doors and Iggy Pop. Most acts would have immediately taken advantage of this flurry of high-profile interest. But, as might have already become clear, Kraftwerk were not like most acts. It took until 1981 for Kraftwerk to capitalise on their newfound credibility. As its name suggests, the focus of the album, Computer World, was on the beige boxes that were becoming an increasingly common sight in the workplace, although it would be some years before the PC revolution dumped one in every other Western home. The best track, Computer Love, is another meditation on the coming together of man and machine. But perversely, the first single to be taken from the LP was the novelty number, Pocket Calculator, a hymn to the must-have classroom gadget of the early 1980s. Whether the massed ranks of dour, post-punk synth duos were fully able to appreciate the significance of lines like, by pressing down a special key, it plays a little melody, isn't clear. But at least it proved once and for all that Kraftwerk had a sense of humour. Pocket Calculator scraped into the British Top 40 in the early summer of 1981, as did Computer Love a couple of months later. But then something peculiar happened. After it had left the charts, Radio DJs began playing the flip side of Computer Love, the three-year-old track The Model from Man Machine. The single slipped back into the charts during the post-Christmas slow period, and by February 1982, it was at number one. The shimmering tones of The Model weren't typical of the Kraftwerk sound that had captivated the likes of Gary Newman, but its wistful irony fitted in nicely with the direction that synth pop had taken. Pioneers like The Human League 
as well as newcomers like Duran Duran and Visage, had become part of the so-called New Romantic movement. Synthesizers were still key elements of their sound, but they were used to create lush textures, rather than brittle, minimalist soundscapes. Lyrics were increasingly escapist and surreal. Rather than confront or even consider the urban strife of Thatcherite Britain, the New Romantics wanted to transcend it. Only a few cult artists, such as Thomas Dolby, shared Kraftwerk's fascination with technology as a subject matter, rather than simply as a means to an end. Dolby's She Blinded Me With Science presents the artist as a mad professor of a distinctly Kraftwerkian bent. Kraftwerk's obsession with the importance of presentation also fitted in neatly with the priorities of the New Romantics. Their deadpan gazes, coupled with a faint air of Weimar decadence, meant that they were just as likely to appear as poster boys in Smash Hits magazine as they were to earn a feature in the NME or Sounds. Their intense privacy and the fact that on the rare occasions when they did speak, their pronouncements were infinitely ambiguous, simply added to their otherworldly cool. However, this new burst of success and exposure was not about to put Kraftwerk on the same level as Duran Duran or Spandau Ballet. After they surfaced for their rare, intensively stage-managed photo shoots, they would disappear back into Kling Klang, cut off from the real world. From 1982-83, I had this idea of uh, writing a composition about our fanatical hobby, riding the bikes and doing the cycling exercises, which we've been doing long before, and to transform this experience into a musical work. Just as the freak success of Autobahn had not really changed them, Kraftwerk refused to let the chart-topping status of the model deflect them from their path. Their obsession with technology, both as a means of expression and as subject matter, continued, although in Kraftwerk's universe, technological progress seemed to be running in reverse. In 1974, they were hymning the praises of ultra-modern motorways and automotive engineering. By 1983, they had a new fetish, bicycles. The band's single, Tour de France, was yet another contemplation of man and machine fusing into one entity as it depicted a pack of cyclists battling through the gruelling annual race. But cycling was not simply another aspect of the physical world to be considered and dissected in Kraftwerk's trademark dispassionate manner. Ralph and Florian were passionate cyclists and as happy to discuss derailer gears and titanium frames as they were to muse on developments in electronic drum programming. And it was cycling that proved to the doubters that the members of Kraftwerk are actually flesh and blood when Ralph suffered a fractured skull after falling off his machine. Or did he? Some outsiders, aware of Kraftwerk's desire to maintain complete control of their image, likened Ralph's mishap to Bob Dylan's motorbike smash of 1966. The singer-songwriter went into seclusion for 18 months, and ever since there have been suggestions that the whole affair was an excuse to get away from it all. Whatever the truth, Kraftwerk's projected album for 1983, Technopop, failed to materialise, and the band disappeared for the next three years. But just as the synth-pop revolution had kept the Kraftwerk banner aloft, the gospel of Kling Klang would again be propagated even while the band members were in creative limbo. However, Kraftwerk's new evangelists had not been attracted by their musings on Europe, or technology, or transport, or neatly pressed shirt and tie combos. They were simply fascinated by the sounds they made. Kraftwerk's first direct impact on the world of dance music came in the early 1980s, when Africa Bambata used a sample of the title track from Trans Europe Express for his seminal hip-hop anthem, Planet Rock. But their stripped-down, synthetic sound had been seeping onto dance floors since the mid-1970s. The minimalist funk that Munich-based Giorgio Moroder crafted for Donna Summer's I Feel Love had the same soulless, mechanical propulsion that characterised Kraftwerk's more up-tempo tracks. A few years later, in England, the survivors of post-punk legends Joy Division reunited after the suicide of frontman Ian Curtis. Not only did New Order's stripped-down synthesised dance sound owe much to the boffins of Kling Klang, 
but their avoidance of interviews and their meticulously constructed record packaging also paid homage to Kraftwerk. As singer Bernard Sumner drawled the words to 1983's global smash Blue Monday, it could just as easily have been Ralph Hutter attempting a Manchester accent. There is an apocryphal story that Kraftwerk contacted New Order to express their admiration for this fusion of rock and electronic beats. Sumner offered to send the band copies of the samples they'd used, but Kraftwerk weren't interested in specific sounds. Nine, nine, purred Florian Schneider. We want to understand the process, which explains Kraftwerk's methods as well as anything. The Pet Shop Boys were another hugely successful act that coupled dance beats to a cool, ironic wit that was hugely influenced by Kraftwerk. Keyboard player Chris Lowe would appear on Top of the Pops doing next to nothing behind his synth, a man machine if ever there was one. This atmosphere of mutual admiration reached its peak in the early 1990s when Sumner's side project with Johnny Marr, Electronic, featured contributions from both Neil Tennant of the Pet Shop Boys and Kraftwerk's Carl Bartos. One fan, whose interest sadly came to nothing, was Michael Jackson. Under the influence of producer Quincy Jones, he'd become interested in European synth sounds, and Jones went so far as to arrange a meeting with Kraftwerk. After the Grand Summit, Florian was heard to claim that Jackson employed seven or eight lookalikes, although none were robots. Despite the fact that no collaboration resulted, much of Jackson's work from Thriller onwards displays the influence of Kraftwerk's stripped-down funk. And in some ways, Jackson's self-reinvention and tangential relationship with reality are even more peculiar than those of Ralph and Florian. Apart from showing distinct affinities for the sound and texture of Kraftwerk's music, artists as diverse as Jackson and Sumner also showcased the technological innovations that were transforming music making. The ethos of Kling Klang, to drive any obviously human element out of music production, was slowly becoming the norm in recording studios. As the 1980s progressed, guitar-based groups began to lose their cultural dominance and power shifted towards the producer, the programmer and, above all, the DJ. The development of sampling technology, whereby sounds could be copied from any source, manipulated and placed in a new musical context, revolutionised the idea of what music could be. But it was only a development from the sounds of windscreen wipers and beeping horns that Kraftwerk used to embellish Autobahn way back in 1974. It seemed that nearly every development in popular music could be traced back to Dusseldorf. Hip-hop, acid house and techno were all based around synthetic drums, repetitive riffs and usually the elevation of the recorded sound to a higher level of importance than live performance. Sales for live concerts began to tail off as music fans spent their money in clubs instead. Bands that had started out as guitar acts, like Primal Scream and The Shaman, began to explore the technology and dynamics of dance music. In Detroit, DJs such as Juan Atkins and Derek May followed the Kling Klang lead in stripping music down to the bare essentials. It was May who described his new style, techno, as being something like the funk pioneer George Clinton getting stuck in an elevator with Kraftwerk. Even more perversely, when they did go and see a name act, it was often a couple of bored-looking blokes in overalls pressing buttons to propel sampled sounds through the speakers, or even a man with a couple of decks playing records. The idea of a music performance as being something unique, spontaneous and human suddenly seemed terribly passé. Although, of course, Kraftwerk had reached that point where it was enough just to press a button more than a decade before. Ironically, as Kraftwerk's key position in the history of popular music became clear, their own ability to create new and exciting music seemed to desert them. Some tracks from the aborted techno-pop album eventually surfaced in 1986 in the form of the LP Electric Café. There wasn't anything particularly bad about the album, but it just seemed that everyone else had picked up where Kraftwerk had left off with Computer World. Calling the opening track Boing Boom Chack could be interpreted as an example of deadpan, self-deprecating humour or it could indicate that they just didn't care anymore. Kraftwerk apparently didn't have anything new to say, or, more significantly, any new ways to say it, and there were no original, interesting noises to put in the background. The power station, it seemed, had suffered an electricity failure.
Well, music. we listen to to the environment, to the sounds, the world of sounds. Klingklang is what we um, use as the world of sounds. Uh, it's also the name of our studio, and um, we go to clubs, to, to discotheques, to dance clubs. We listen to the sound in the streets, mm. the sound in nature. So it's all incorporated into music. It wasn't just that Kraftwerk's fans had transferred their attentions from the originals to the copyists. All was not well within the empire of Kling Klang. The slow progress of recording material after the release of Computer Love had caused tensions within the band, which in turn led to Wolfgang Fleur and Karl Bartos leaving Kraftwerk during the 1980s. Bartos contented himself with various recording projects, including the distinctly Kraftwerky electric music. Fleur also kept up his musical career, specifically the act Yamo, in which he collaborated with German electronica duo Mouse on Mars. But it was the percussionists' literary endeavours that stirred Ralph and Florian from their normally passive attitudes. The manuscript for his autobiography, I Was a Robot, led to a flurry of writs and injunctions from Kling Klang. Not that he seemed to be making any particularly outrageous allegations, however. He claimed that Ralph and Florian could be cold and aloof to other band members, that they had expensive tastes in travel and gadgets, and that, shock horror, Kraftwerk had groupies, like every other successful music act on the planet, with the exception of Radiohead and Cliff Richard. Apparently, it wasn't the specific allegations that affected the Kraftwerk founder's equilibrium. It was simply that someone had managed to break through the absolute control that they had established over the band and its image for over a decade. By now, they had taken to replacing the real musicians with robots in public appearances and videos. Wolfgang Fleur's book, which was eventually published with some of the more salacious details removed, reminded the outside world that Kraftwerk were still human beings of a sort. That, it seemed, was something approaching treason in Kraftwerk land. The 1990s had arrived with no new material from Kraftwerk. The combined ranks of guitar rockers attempted a backlash against the impact of the synth and the sampler. Grunge in the United States and Britpop in the UK claimed to offer a return to so-called honesty, to the heady days of punk and Beatlemania. But running alongside these retro excursions were movements like Electronica and Industrial, all making use of the blank attitude that Kraftwerk had perfected. The guitar rockers were seduced. Noel Gallagher of Oasis recorded with the Chemical Brothers, and Radiohead moved deeper into abstract soundscapes. At the same time, the music that topped the world's charts, from the likes of NSYNC, the Spice Girls and Britney Spears, revelled in its enemies' appalled squawks about conveyor belt music and manufactured pop. Of course it was manufactured, in the same way that motorways and pocket calculators are manufactured. And who had that idea first? Kraftwerk might not have felt able to grace the world with any new music, but there were occasional hopeful signs that Ralph and Florian hadn't jacked the whole thing in to become professional cyclists. A series of compilations and remix albums reminded people of the band's status in pop, even while other acts were taking electronic music into new directions. The best of these was 1991's The Mix, a set of reworkings of their classic tracks intended to reinforce the band's dance floor credibility. For most bands, a collection of dance remixes is a dispiriting experience. For Kraftwerk, it seemed to make sense. As the borders between rock and dance music became increasingly porous, DJs and programmers started to come out of the studio and invaded that last bastion of rock supremacy, the Open Air Festival. Smart promoters discover that acts such as Aphex Twin, Orbital and Music, all of whom had name-checked Kraftwerk as influences, were just as likely to pull in paying punters as any big guitar band. It seemed an obvious question. Why not get Kraftwerk to show the young whippersnappers how it's done? The idea of these middle-aged men in suits bringing their high-tech equipment into a muddy field in the English countryside did seem a little peculiar. But Ralph and Florian always liked springing surprises. So, it was at the tribal gathering of 1997 that Kraftwerk presented their music to the grimy masses. A mixture of old favourites and more obscure album tracks sent the fans, most of whom weren't even born when Kraftwerk released their first album, into paroxysms of delight. The festival appearance was so successful that the band embarked on a world tour the following year. Audiences adored them. 
For one thing, they could teach some of their followers in the dance tents about stage technique. They didn't do very much, apart from pressing occasional buttons, but very few acts brought along life-sized robots of themselves to help out with the encores. In fact, at the bigger festivals, most audience members were so far away that they couldn't actually tell which were the robots and which were the real musicians. If, of course, the musicians were real in the first place. Kraftwerk had proved that they were more than a historical curiosity, but it was well over 10 years since the band had released an album of new material. Had the Dusseldorf well run dry? Well, we vision that we had was uh, electronic fox music, and uh, over the years it has become a reality, from pocket calculators to computers. And so, for us, it's very, uh, very energetic feedback to go and continue and work further in this direction. The squabble over Wolfgang Fleur's book had exposed a paradox at the heart of Kraftwerk's image. They'd made their reputation, above all, as a band that embraced technology, both as a means to making music and as a subject matter for their songwriting. But the most startling technological innovations of the 1990s and the new millennium have been in the fields of media and communications. The World Wide Web, email and mobile telephones had brought people together in ways that had seemed like science fiction only a few years before. Media such as television had embraced interactivity, with developments in reality shows and even dramas relying on input from viewers. But the high priests of technological pop seemed to have spurned these developments. Don't bother trying to email Kraftwerk. The Kling Klang studio in Dusseldorf doesn't even have a phone line, let alone a modem. There is no receptionist. Any snail mail addressed to the band is returned unopened. They have a website, but it does little more than tell you when their next gig is. For Ralph and Florian, mass media is a one-way thing. They create what they want to create and deliver what they want to deliver to the masses. And that's it. In that way, they retain some ideal of artistic purity. However, in 2000, it wasn't any kind of artistic creative urge that prompted their first brand new material for over a decade. It was the lure of hard cash. To celebrate the millennium, the German government set up a lavish festival, lauding the country's scientific and technological developments and plugging increasing ties with the country's continental neighbours. Who better than the creators of Trans Europe Express to come up with a theme tune for the event called Expo 2000? Which is how Ralph and Florian came to pick up a paycheck of 400,000 Deutschmarks about £150,000 or a quarter of a million US dollars for writing a jingle that lasted a grand total of four seconds. In reality, this was pretty insignificant compared to the hundreds of millions that Expo 2000 ended up costing the German taxpayer. But, coupled with Wolfgang Fleur's unflattering portrayal of the Kraftwerk masterminds, it seemed to paint an image of the duo as men utterly cut off from reality. They, more than any other act, were responsible for making people realise that the idea of German pop music wasn't just a tautological joke. It was time to rebuild bridges. In 2003, Kraftwerk released their first album of new material in 17 years. To be precise, it wasn't entirely new, since much of the album is based on their single, Tour de France, released 20 years previously. But Tour de France soundtracks is more than a remix of Past Glories. The old favourite is reworked over four tracks, until very little remains of the original. There are also hymns to the metal from which bicycle frames are made. Titanium, The Wonders of Heart Machine, Electrocardiogram, and best of all, the charmingly loopy Vitamin, the first pop song ever to itemise the amino acids essential to healthy eating. To mark the release, the band embarked upon a world tour in 2004, with Ralph and Florian assisted by two new recruits, Fritz Hilbert and Henning Schmidt. The concerts, which included an appearance at the Coachella Festival in California, were a huge critical success. For the first encore, the band handed over control to their robotic lookalikes, who played, inevitably, the robots. 
And then the musicians returned, wearing suits decorated with fluorescent wires that glowed an unearthly green in the dim light. Kraftwerk had become, as they had threatened, man-machines. Kraftwerk's impact on popular music is impossible to overstate. Their icy fingers have probed into almost every genre that's appeared in the last quarter century, from the clanking industrial metal of Trent Reznor's Nine Inch Nails to the airbrushed pure pop of Britney Spears. Dance music from hip hop to acid house, from cheesy Euro disco to the bleakest extremes of minimalist techno is inconceivable without their example. Timberland's bass-free skeletal riffs provide the musical heart of the R&B revival. Critically lauded acts such as Dizzy Rascal and The Streets all wear their Kraftwerk influences proudly. And they have fans in every pocket of the music industry. It comes as no surprise when a synthesizer band like Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark pays tribute to Kraftwerk, as they did by recording a version of Neon Lights in 1991 on the album Sugar Tax. But one wouldn't necessarily expect the same level of respect from the Thames Valley shoegazers ride, arch-Irish ironists The Divine Comedy, and Steve Albini's seminal hardcore trio Big Black. However, all three have paid tribute to The Model. Entire albums of Kraftwerk cover versions have come from the German-Chilean mambo parodist Senor Coconut and from the Balanescu Quartet, a neo-baroque string combo. Not only are they great sonic innovators, but their songs stand up by themselves. But Kraftwerk are not important simply because of the sounds they've made and the people that those sounds have influenced. In an era of celebrity culture, where the antics of Victoria Beckham and Paris Hilton can push the Iraqi war off the front page, Kraftwerk show us that there's a different way to play the fame game. Reclusive and impassive, their apparent anti-image stance has become an image. Their apparent humorlessness often seems like one big, droll, ironic, Teutonic joke at the expense of everybody else. The likes of Eminem and Oasis want desperately to be seen as subversive bad boys, but Kraftwerk truly subvert the core of rock and roll. Not through driving Rolls Royces into swimming pools or throwing televisions out of hotel windows, but by looking at the world through weird spectacles, to which only they have the prescription. They see bicycles and vitamin pills, power stations and shop window dummies, motorways and pocket calculators. And they know you can't write pop songs about these things, but they do it anyway. Like all great innovative artists, like Picasso and James Joyce and Stravinsky, they make us look at the world in new ways. And they do it so well that they can get the whole planet dancing. In a strictly deadpan, ironic, non-smiling manner, of course. Maybe, way back in 1974, they really did mean to sing fun, fun, fun. Thank you for buying Maximum Kraftwerk. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. Details of our full catalogue are listed on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Thanks again for listening and goodbye for now.